NZR Aero Sports, Icarus Canopies, now Gyro. That's right, we've rebranded, and Gyro is our next generation. It honours our founder, as that's the name we knew him by, but Gyro also marks the start of a new chapter. And not to be biased, but it's going to be fucking epic. Long story short, we're more us than ever. So if you're new to the sport, or even a Sky God Ninja Turtle, welcome. I think our valiant leader Lucy, Gyro's daughter, says it best. And we still got that fuck your attitude. <laughs> Rebrand! Woo! Rebrand woo indeed, Lucy. Anyway, head over to gyro.com for more info and get amongst your legends. I was 19, broke, unemployed, and sold my girlfriend's canopy for drug money. So, I thought I'd better sew her a new one. What a sentence, and what a story. This describes the humble yet outrageous beginnings of NZ Aerosports, the home of Icarus Canopies, in the words of our founder himself. From getting a paratrooper toy from his mom, watching parachutes at the DZ as a six-year-old, jumping off the wharf with a parachute made from bedsheets, doing his first jump at 16, sewing his first canopy on a borrowed machine at 19, and starting to sell parachutes out of a garage in 1986, Paul Gyro Martin had an undying love for the sky. Our company started with one man with the wildest of spirits in a true blue sky dream, a renegade. In the time that Gyro created and ran the Icarus Canopies brand until he passed away in 2017, he pushed everything he had to its limits. We miss him and we always will. Gyro is the next generation of NZ Aerosports. It honors our founder, of course, because it was the name we all knew him by, but Gyro the rebrand also marks the start of a new chapter, our next jump. Gyro is the space between sound and silence, art and science, chaos and calm. Gyro is a state of epic tranquility that transcends understanding. That moment, in the door, in free fall, mid-swoop, where nothing but the present exists. A perfect balance of euphoria and thrill. Gyro captures our passion for flying and our commitment to designing break-the-fucking-rules canopies that deliver pilots pure, wild flight. Hey gang, so... I got a new book out. It's called The Upside of Fear, and it's exactly what you think it's about. It's about the good side of, well, getting scared. In it, we talk not only about the science and biology behind fear, but the psychology as well. And it's not just coming from me. It's coming from some of the best in the sport. Omar Al-Hijalan, Jeff Provenzano, Maxine Tate, and so many more have contributed their sometimes terrifying stories to the book to help you overcome your fear. So head to the lunaticfringepodcast.com. You're going to find the link to the book there as well as the other books. It's available in ebook, paperback, hardback, and audiobook right now. Coming straight from the cockpit, it's another episode of Lunatic Fringe with the fucking pilot. Ready, set, go! Back in the can for another edition of the Lunatic Fringe podcast and a new friend that's over in the Netherlands right now. Tell me, who the fuck are you and what do you do? Hey, man. I'm, uh, I'm Connor. Connor Fig. Uh, currently freelance coaching, tunnel, sky, and generally trying to meet as many cool skydivers as I can. Dude, you're a busy dude, Been, man. Uh, quite a journey so far. You're, you're a busy guy. because <laughs> It I... feels like that way. Uh, when I when I look for people that I want to yeah, talk to, had a bit of... oh please go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was uh, just going to say I think my uh, my partners would agree with you. Uh, but I've not seen nearly enough of them this year, so uh, always telling me to do less events and spend more time at home. But uh, so far, that's not happened. So. I mean, <laughs> man, find the, a balance. if at the end of the day, if it's your passion and it's what you enjoy, then you you go as hard as you can personally. 
For sure. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, something I've been working towards for a long time. So I'm kind of uh, enjoying the ride at the moment. And yeah, maybe I'll sure. find a bit more peace a little, uh, a little further down the road. Well, I was I was saying one of the things that I look for when I want to talk to new people is especially going through social media is finding people that are clearly enthusiastic about what's going on. And there's no doubt scrolling through your Instagram page that this fucking guy likes what he does. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, it's. Uh, I feel very, very privileged to be able to do the uh, the job that I do. Um, I mean, a lot of very cool people. Uh, seen a lot of exciting places. Had some slightly scary moments, but you know that's the the spice of life, and it uh, yeah keeps me uh, keeps it me on my toes. <laughs> it isn't that. So tell me, how did it all start for you? I mean, uh, was Scott having something that was on the radar for you right away, or was it other so-called extreme sports that led you into it, or how did you get started? So skydiving, I, I've been doing it about 12 years now, I think. I think it started in uh, 2012, um, but it had been on my radar for a really long time. I uh, think probably from when I was like four years old, Um I saw my dad, uh, my mum bought him a static line jump for his uh, his birthday. Skydiving did not run in the family. Uh, neither of them had ever done it before. But I went along and uh, watched my dad do it. And apparently I just got absolutely hooked on it. So uh, there's loads of pictures of me as a kid dressed up with like swimming goggles on and like my dad's backpack, throwing <laughs> myself onto my parents' bed, pretending to jump out of a plane um yeah <laughs> apparently I was uh pretty fixated on it quite young um my parents even made me like mixtapes of uh all the uh 80s action skydiving scenes where they'd like <laughs> cut them all out the uh the, the films and put it on a VHS for me so they, they were kind of a very good job at, they were uh, cutting out all the swear words though <laughs> they were enabling the hell out of you weren't they oh they really did yeah yeah it was uh yeah never really thought I could do it as a job um I saw if like, see tandem instructors when uh when i uh, kind of visited the drop zone for a tandem on my 18th but uh yeah i kind of went to university to study engineering uh separate from that and there i found a skydive club and kind of realized that there's a little bit more to it than uh just like stunt work or or tandems sure so, you know it's there. It's funny because it seems to be very much a, a UK thing, and I'm assuming this is where you started. It is, yes. Yeah, so it seems to very much be a UK thing uh, more than anywhere else that I've heard of with skydiving clubs and especially university stuff. They've got a really good scene of it. Yeah, like I've lived all over the world now, and I've never seen any other like university skydiving clubs the way they have it set up in the, in the UK. It's it's amazing like it gets a lot of uh kind of young students uh people trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives um just experiencing their first bit of freedom from uh from living at home with their parents and it shows them a a, a different path to one that they might otherwise take so sure. for me it was a, it was a game changer being able to kind of meet other weirdos who were uh, willing to go and throw themselves <laughs> out of planes and yeah do a lot of drinking it always seemed like a bit of a contradiction because although I've never been to the UK, I've got more friends than I can count in the industry that are from the UK and it's yeah. famous for shit weather. So, you know, <laughs> skydiving being so uber popular in a place like that always kind of made me chuckle. Yeah, I think it's probably because it's less about the skydiving. It's more about the drinking because you spend so much time <laughs> on the ground uh, waiting with your mates to do a skydive that uh you end up uh, getting to know really, really well the ones who uh, are willing to stick around after bad weather day after bad weather day. So sure. uh, it, now, it weeds out the people who are going to be really committed quite of early course, on. Of course. Now, in university, what was the uh, original goal? You said engineering. Was there a, a career in mind when you grew up or you just decided to skip that part of it? <laughs> Yeah, um, I was planning on uh, working as an engineer. Uh, I did mechanical engineering, um, focusing on ship design, so like naval architecture. Um, I did a, a four-year degree, and I think by year four of the degree, I went to less than 3% of my lectures because I just spent the whole time <laughs> skydiving or uh, or packing parachutes to pay for skydiving. So I managed to still get the degree. Um, 
and yeah as i kind of got to the the end and uh um graduated uh partners and i they were planning on going around the world living in camper vans and traveling and seeing places and that sounded like a much better idea than uh, than the kind of more mundane engineering jobs that i had lined up so sure. i was already working as a coach at that point and uh decided to kind of pursue that and see where it led now what was the draw to um the design and engineering of ships uh numbers always kind of appealed to me um i'm a bit of a numbers guy anyone who coaches with me i tend to be get quite technical talking about like lift and drag and uh, degrees um but when i was growing up i lived in a, a town called plymouth in the uk and it's right on the coast it's a beautiful city it's got this lovely kind of uh harbor nearby so i spent a lot of my uh childhood um sailing like little dinghies and occasionally when i uh, could convince someone who owned a yacht to let me on it i'd go and uh sail with them as well so it seemed a, a good way of combining uh, my two passions at the time well and it, i mean correct me if i'm wrong but there's a fair amount of similarity between hydrodynamics and aerodynamics and it is with sailing yeah. you're actually utilizing both quite a bit because yeah. and i never i never really imagined sailing until i had done a bit when i was living in new zealand but having a sailor point out to me uh, what to look for with the sails and why the trim tabs were up there and and all of that stuff and it instantly tied me into my career choice in aviation both flying yeah. and skydiving and i went oh i fucking get it okay yeah there's so many similarities between the two and um, more that I kind of discover all the time. Like you mentioned, the the trim tabs, being able to understand when a sail is set correctly, how you maximize the lift, uh, working with angle of attack, um, even being able to apply like when you're flying in the tunnel and you can feel bits of like turbulence and like disturbed air and how you can change the shape of your body in order to uh, remove that turbulence uh, is it, really helped me kind of uh be much more efficient in my flying and help other people kind of discover that efficiency as well so sure. i'm very well, grateful for that background you nailed the the perfect word to describe it all which was lift and that was the one disconnect that i had thinking about sailing in the wrong way and as soon as they described it that way i realized that it's still relative wind it's just the direction it's coming from and the angle you're using it at and it was it instantly became understandable yeah yeah when you realize that the the sails are just wings um it it makes everything work uh at least for me much better in my head because sure. then i could think about basically cutting off half of a plane sticking it upright in the water and then uh learning how to generate lift sure. from uh, relative wind with that um Although, but when i was uh doing my degree i was uh, my final year project was working on um, designing a, uh, a foiling catamaran uh, system for the America's Cup. And uh, when in the America's Cup, they kind of progressed from these like normal, like uh, sail, single skin uh, sails. And they just removed that and just put a straight up uh, wing with uh, uh, ailerons and uh, rudders and things on the on top of the boat platform. And the efficiency they get out of those things is ridiculous. So when I saw like the shape of these uh, wings, it started really clicking in my head the the similarities between yeah the, the sailing world and the and aviation as well. Well, I had the opportunity to see, I think it was one of the Oracle boats that had something similar to what you were describing and, and saw that and went, no fucking way. Yeah. <laughs> and then was, to, uh... to see it in action and the speed, but with the foil in the water and the wing above, it's insane. It's nuts, isn't it? Yeah, the it, it looks unreal. And like when they're able to get faster speeds than uh, than the speed of the wind, it's it feels like there's something broken with physics at that point yeah 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 no it's <laughs> it's absolutely incredible and i mean it, it kind of mirrors uh, the progression that i've seen in the sport with the wings that we fly nowadays and the stuff that is taken for granted now that when i started 29 years ago was you know of a cartoon kind of dream because it was so out there yeah exactly yeah we're uh we're living in a, a golden age of skydiving at the moment and Having these 
lots of technical people in the sport who understand the crossovers between like uh, different um, subsections of the sport, like uh, paragliding and how we're now seeing uh, like the supine flying position in the mutant harnesses to help people fly uh, more efficiently. Uh, this human platform in all the new kind of high performance canopies like it, I'm I'm so excited to see what what comes next because there's just innovation after innovation these days and it's a it's a really exciting time to be a part of it. Well, sure, and I I give a, a lot of credit to the fact that skydiving is such an attractive sport and an attractive community that it's drawing people such as yourself with backgrounds that are so dramatically different than the sport bringing all the things that they've learned from all these other fields to bear on our sport like julian who designed arguably the fastest fucking canopy on the planet for gyro brought all of that his experience yeah you know i mean he brought his experience to bear in in the sport now, is that something that is appealed to you kind of going in that direction it, it has yeah for sure um i i'm not so involved in like the uh the technical and design side of the sport but where i have been able to kind of use my knowledge is in the body flight and being able to kind of help people fly more efficiently both in the sky and in the tunnel um it's given me a better understanding of flying my body and my canopy but uh yeah being able to kind of take a technical minded approach to uh to the sort of flying that I'm doing with people, especially now that we're uh, becoming more and more dynamic uh, with our movements, we uh, are able to really use our bodies as wings. Like that's the the shape you're trying to make the whole time is stretching out, like getting that cord length as long as you can to increase lift. And uh, it's it's really interesting seeing people kind of come to grips with these quite intangible uh ideas of lift and drag and being able to actually kind of use their bodies to see the effects of changing their shape and uh being able to fly at lower speeds or fly faster in a straight line so uh i i really like uh nerding out over this stuff with uh with my students well it's super exciting as well i mean as a long time tandem instructor i fell into you know, you try and break down things for your students, especially tandems that have no idea what they're dealing with. And you would always have the people that, oh, we're going to go fall out of an airplane. And I would always happily uh, tell them, P human beings can fly. We just don't glide particularly well. Yes. <laughs> like, we can absolutely fly from here over there. We just need a lot of altitude to do that. But we're absolutely flying. We just need assistance to get where we need to get to make that <laughs> shit happen. But it's it's fun, too, trying to break down um, the basics. You know, as a, as a previous AFF instructor, you're trying to explain to people just the basics of being able to, you know, turn left, turn right, track and backslide. But for you, especially as you get higher level um, with body flight, the minutia, the shit that you guys are having to do, because, and I just made this in a in a comment with Lori Libby yesterday, um, talking, was the stuff that you guys do now to make dramatic changes in the way you're flying in the tunnel with such subtle movements body-wise is insane to me. It's gotten to the point where I can no longer tell you how you made your body do what it did because I can't see it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's getting really, really down to the, the super tiny controls, like, like um, uh, the difference in how your body flies when, you're, uh, when you've got a breath in and then how it flies when you breathe out and empty your lungs and go concave on your chest um down to just like the the direction that you're pointing your toes whether you flex them up or drop them down a little bit it's the those are the sort of details that are becoming more and more important as we kind of push that that, that leading edge of the sport and uh really try and discover what the human body is uh is capable of doing sure i mean I, I remember watching as as tunnel flying was really really starting to take off you would watch talented flyers flying but it still looked like hard work and yes. now i'll go i went down to aeronautica to visit my friend naomi and rob jones was flying at the time and it's fucking oh, you know nomers oh yeah <laughs> yeah nomers and i are great friends um and uh watching them fly it's effortless it is smiles yeah. on their faces and they're spending more time paying attention to the guys in front of them and clearly just 
their body's just doing it. And it, it's just become <laughs> this effortless thing that kind of makes me hate you guys a little bit. <laughs> I get that. I definitely get that. I uh, I feel the same way. When there's uh, someone that I'm uh, trying to learn some move off of or uh, replicate some part of their flying that appeals to me, it's it's like they're speaking in a foreign language until you kind of find that, that one thing that, uh, that changes it and all of a sudden you kind of get a better understanding of how they're doing what they're doing. Sure why coaching is amazing but uh, sure. up until that point <laughs> it's definitely uh tempting to be a little uh yeah for sure about it well and i mean i've been in the sport a long time so i understand what it's like from both sides of the perspective because you know seeing low time skydivers or, or low time students that you know struggle with stability out the door and then realizing yeah. i used to be that person and now you could blindfold me ball me up and throw me out of the plane and i'll instantly be stable you i mean so you see it from both sides but it's next level with what i see in the tunnel it really is yeah the 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 tunnel and like the the difference in the amount of time that you can spend in there like you take someone with 30 minutes and you can teach them to be stable on their belly and then you just take it up orders of magnitude up to like thousands and thousands of hours some of these uh coaches these days and it's it's truly incredible to see just how comfortable humans can become in pretty much any environment i mean you see it the same with uh with swimmers obviously we've had the uh the Olympics recently and just the incredible way they're kind of moving through the water in some of these uh, events. It, it defies all logic. And I know there is technique there, but it, it it's like uh, they put a dolphin in a human suit for a while. It's yeah. Yeah. Looking at it without an, uh, an insider's understanding is, is wondrous. And that's kind of part of the appeal of, uh, of tunnel flying, at least for me, because when you take skydiving, which is it's not really a spectator sport at the end of the day, like you can watch videos on a GoPro, but uh, it doesn't really bring the essence of what we do to the people. But um, tunnel kind of does. It, it puts you right in front of uh, like first timers and anyone else coming to uh, to visit facility, and they can see what the result of thousands and thousands of hours uh, can can do to the human body and give you this kind of understanding of uh, the air in a different way that we just we've never really been able to experience in the sport up until quite recently with uh, the kind of uh, the well more tunnels being built around the world tunnels also makes it a lot more accessible in that um not only can you see it happening firsthand but there's not a lot of money and the the potential for death hanging over your head to go <laughs> you know do that one thing that you've only seen on a tv screen now you're looking at you know auntie mary that's on the other side of that glass with a huge grin on her face going up exactly. and down you know with an instructor and you you can realize very quickly that if you have the time and money, you can eventually do all those things, which is one of the reasons I'm not bitter about uh, incredibly talented tunnel flyers, because I, I understand that with enough time and money, I could get damn good. I just don't have either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's okay me, me neither that's why yeah. i became a, an instructor that's the way it goes right <laughs> so let's jump back a bit to skydiving so you said that you were already coaching by the time you got your degree um getting out of college and obviously knew you wanted to go kind of do the the jumping life for a little while was this about when your parents started having buyer's remorse <laughs> uh it definitely took a long time for them to uh really see skydiving as a uh, an, a potential alternative career like i think uh, they've definitely seen me progressing into engineering from from quite an early age <laughs> and when all of a sudden that kind of uh, went out the window um credit where credit's due they were they were super supportive but i could definitely tell they were kind of like waiting for the the uh the honeymoon period to end or the uh kind of infatuation with it to change and it, when it never really did they've uh they've really embraced it and uh they've been yeah super supportive of, of everything i've been able to do with it um but honestly i 
it's kind of their fault I got into it. Like they uh, they set me off in the early days when I was four, showing me skydiving. They got all yeah. the movies and things. And then like uh, when I was growing up, like the reason I was uh, kind of coaching free flying angles from like even my early days in the career um, was I think probably down to the amount of time I spent as a, a gymnast and a, a platform diver. So I was doing gymnastics for like eight years and uh like springboard and platform diving for another six pretty much all the way through uh school and um that gave me a lot of body awareness which meant i could pick things up quite quickly it's been a really really valuable tool um and i'm also quite a lazy person so i kind of knew i'd uh i'm not one of those people who can uh, go to the gym every day and i knew that was never really going to happen so it kind of incentivized me to find a a job and a career that I kind of have to be constantly working out in order to uh to, to do my job every day so sure. that's how I motivate myself to stay in shape as well <laughs> nice well the the uh, um the gymnast and the diving thing seems to be a a relatively common thread in tunnel flying there's a number of tunnel flyers that I've talked to with a pretty substantial gymnastics background and it's that body awareness right exactly yeah it's the the understanding of knowing without looking at your legs what your legs are doing and exactly the shape that they're in um it's something that is uh there's a lot of crossover skills there even down to being able to uh understand how to to balance yourself because so much of flying does come down to balance whether you're leaning your weight towards your uh, your head end or leaning it down towards your leg end creates very different uh, uh, movement types. And that's something that, although it might not be in the same way, we've been practicing for a very long time. Uh, I pissed off quite a lot of um, uh, my friends when I finally got around to learning head down. Um, uh, but Rosie, she, uh, she and I were always really competitive in our early days. So we were like learning to, uh, we got our A licenses together. We were learning to sit fly together. And then um, she decided she wanted to, to learn head down one day. And I did not have the money to do any more than like, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes of coaching. So uh, she, she bought a couple of hours when um, the, uh, I think it was at the uh, British um, Symposium, basically. It was, they had a cheap rate going on. So she bought a couple of hours. I bought an hour. And then uh, we booked in with a uh, uh, killer, uh, Adam Matacola, who was like one of the best coaches in the UK at the time. And uh, I got in and did, I think, within about 20 minutes of trying to fly head down, I was uh, carving and switching and laying out and things like that. So I pissed off a lot of people. <laughs> um, but I just told them that like, I've been training head down for... 12 years previously, I just wasn't doing it in the wind tunnel. Sure. Well, now for something like that, I got to the point where, um, and I'm, I'm not a talented tunnel flyer at all, but I would get up off my head uh, on off the net. And I never did get to transitions, but I would imagine at some point it really is like a, a switch getting flipped because everybody that I've seen get it goes from, I have no fucking clue how to stay there to they're on their head. And they're staying on their head and now they're working transition. So is it like that for most people? It really is. Yeah. There's um it's it's not so much a skill. Like your body, if you uh just hold a uh a, a daffy shape, it doesn't even have to be a good one naturally. If you just hold that shape and throw yourself out of the plane, you're going to end up more or less head down. Um that all of your weight in your body is kind of, uh, or at least for most people, is centered kind of in their upper torso. So as long as you're spreading your legs and you're getting lift on those, you basically turn yourself into a, a, a shuttlecock shape. So the, the for Americans. Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you guys call it badminton over there? Or? Badminton birdie, yeah. I don't, most uh, Americans, at least I think most Americans wouldn't know shuttlecock. We have weird, uh, weird words in uh, in this yeah, side yeah. of the world. You invented <laughs> so, the language, so it's it's yours to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. But uh, yeah, the the actual shape itself is not that difficult to fly. Like, I tell people that head down is the most natural way for for humans to fly. It's uh, when when you know how to do it, it's all you will want to do the whole time because it's it's so easy. But 
getting to the point where you can balance that is just a, a matter of time. And everyone, uh, it feels like crap for the first however long it might take, but there's this clicking moment which uh, comes at various different points for people, but you can see it immediately. All of a sudden, rather than like fighting with someone to uh, to hold them in place, you can feel all the tension in the grips just like melt away. And it's like they, uh, they you've been flying them and then all of a sudden they're taking control of the wheel and they, uh, they just start doing it for themselves. And honestly, it's one of my favorite feelings. Uh, I was going to say, that, that's, that's, that's got to so be fucking thrilling. awesome. <laughs> it really is, yeah. And everyone reacts differently, but you get a lot of like wide-eyed, shocked faces. Like, I'm doing it. It's happening. <laughs> so, and, uh, with especially with people coming from a skydiving background, like I went as a skydiver, I learned how to free fly in the air. I didn't have the opportunity to do it in the tunnel, and yeah. I thought as a skydiver. I can free fly. So obviously I'm going to be able to go in the tunnel. Maybe I'll move around a little bit, but it shouldn't be that hard. But the idea of flying free flying without that container um, is also a very alien thing. Like the body positions to maintain a, a powerful sit fly are completely different in a tunnel to me than they are in the sky. I would never shrug my shoulders back and arch my back the wrong way. And so yeah. it's very strange. Do you find that you have to um, really work extra hard with skydivers because we're fighting so much? Yes and no. Um, it depends on like bad or bad habits that are sometimes developed in the sky uh, can be quite hard to to break out of. So some people who have learned to sit fly in the sky, you tend to get that like classic position of like really wide knees, a bit lent forwards on the chest, and the arms out. Uh, super far behind just to kind of deal with the uh, the burble of the rig um, whereas when we're teaching people in the tunnel it's uh, and you don't have the rig to step up in the airflow we can really uh, um, force people to not fly the arms and instead get kind of relaxed with it fly the big surfaces the the torso the shoulders the head um, and when they have an understanding of that and then you take it to the sky and throw a rig on it there's a little bit of uh, kind of translating it to the sky, but the physics is still the same. It's it's still the same wind hitting your body. So when you kind of uh, sub out the the lift that you were getting on the the back of the shoulders when you're flying in the tunnel, and realize that it's the same lift, you're just getting it kind of on the the back of your rig that's uh, keeping you sat up. Then all of a sudden you have people who are able to fly and not have their arms all the way back here, but they can take them in front, do double grips with people. And uh, kind of, I, I try to teach as many people in uh, in the tunnel as I can, even just for a little bit, because it really helps get rid of um, kind of habits that naturally build up in the sky when you're trying to learn something with a, with a rig on your back. It's sure. um, You can either do the a lot of work later on, or you can do a little bit of work in the tunnel uh, kind of early days, and it saves a, a bunch of time later on. Well, and the biggest thing, opinion. the biggest thing that I've noticed with the tunnel is how much more efficient the flying is. Um, and the, the the greatest way to know that that's the case is watching a bigger student struggle to get off the net in a sit fly and his instructor in a full on fucking stand up carving around him. <laughs> and to realize yeah. that uh holy shit yeah there's there's a better way to do that yeah the efficiency is uh is nuts but at the end of the day like tunnel coaches are really lazy people like we we want to to fly and use as little energy as possible like when i'm coming and doing uh camps over in finland i i'll be flying five or six hours a day with people and if i compare that to like a day of coaching with people in the sky where i'm maybe in free fall for five, six minutes throughout an entire day. Um, it just doesn't, you're not forced to use your muscles in the sky in the same way that you are when you're flying lots and lots of time in the tunnel. So we naturally gravitate towards ways of flying things that are as easy as possible and use the the absolute minimum amount of energy and the, the smallest number of muscles. Sure. So. I think that's where a lot of the positions and the flying styles that are developing these days are coming from is just, 
us wanting to uh, to be able to keep flying as much as possible without <laughs> getting absolutely wrecked. <laughs> I love that you basically just said all the best flyers got that way because they're fucking lazy. <laughs> They are fucking lazy, all of them. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that out there to for the future guests for sure. Oh, I'm so, gonna get so much hate for that. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. So talk me through your personal progress because uh you um obviously you're very passionate about the coaching and stuff, but you went from college into deciding you were gonna work into the sport and then obviously on to competition level. So how did that look for you? um so i i never really had any plans to compete in skydiving i i did a lot of competition in um in diving and in gymnastics and i didn't do very well if i'm quite honest it was uh it was not my forte um but all those kind of crap competitions i did in the early days have actually served me quite well these days because Half of competing is the uh, the mental side of it, being able to deal with the the stress of being in that environment and wanting to perform well. Um, so it wasn't until I uh, moved to Finland and started um, um, running Aeronautica that I actually got kind of pushed into competing um, by my uh, my partners. They uh, they saw me just demo flying all the time, and in the UK the the freestyle. Uh, competition that they do at nationals is uh, a much kind of reduced version of the the international standard so like if you go and compete freestyle at the worlds you need to be able to uh, make a free routine um, set it to music if you want and then there are compulsory rounds as well with uh, like I think six different moves that for a beginner tunnel flyer are really really difficult to uh to do there it's a really high standard to meet for most people um but what i really like about the uk is their nationals they just completely do away with the uh the compulsory rounds and instead they have people uh just come along with a one minute uh free routine for everyone to watch um so you don't really have to put that much training and effort in to just show people what you can do um so I think in like 2017 or 2018, uh, I was planning on going back to the UK for the UK nationals anyway, just to see some friends and watch. And uh, I got pushed to uh, to enter freestyle super last minute. I think I came up with a routine like the day before we flew to the competition. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I went along and um, that ended up winning that competition and did the same again the next year um and it kind of came to the realization after a while that i, was that I kind of enjoy freestyle flying it's uh it's not nice to kind of show it off to people and because at that point i was then kind of um uh qualified to go and compete at the worlds um i then forced myself to learn all the compulsory moves and actually start kind of spending a bit of time and effort on learning how to really compete well in freestyle and uh that's kind of where it where it grew from really so it, it never came it was never part of the plan it just kind of happened by accident really because uh I, I love demo flying and um blasting around the tunnel but uh yeah it's a it's a nice way to show off what you can do to people I can definitely understand how you've ended up grinding up against a few people when basically that story boils down to I kind of fell into a competition and won it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not making myself any favors here. <laughs> I get it. No, but you know, it's kind of funny too because for as much shit as we talk as skydivers, it's um mostly always in good fun, and it always comes with it's an an incredible level of respect. I mean, and this is something actually that uh, um I, I still to this day have to try and explain to my wife because she's not a skydiver. She's not in the industry at all. She doesn't understand the sometimes horribly insulting culture of air sports. <laughs> and that, you know, it's difficult to explain. No, no, no. They said those horrible things about me because they like me. If I'm not being insulted, then I get worried. Exactly. That's that's the time where you need to look at yourself and go, why, why aren't people giving me shit? <laughs> Maybe I'm doing something wrong and I need to, uh, to work on myself a little bit. 
Absolutely. Now, I, I wanted to get back to you spent a couple of years uh, uh, here in Finland. And before I moved here, I had no idea that there was much of anything in, in way of the sport. But Aeronautica, the tunnel that's about an hour and a half outside of Helsinki, is like one of the most popular spots in Europe for you guys to come do camps. It is. Yeah, it's uh, it's an incredible facility. And it was unfortunately shut down for a, a few years. Um, back when I worked there, it was uh, under different ownership. And it was built back in the days when uh, there was still a lot of traffic between uh, Helsinki and St. Petersburg. So I think the plan was when they first built it that they were on this kind of new main road between the two of them. And then uh, pretty much the day that they opened their doors for the first time, the ruble crashed and all of that traffic just kind of uh, stopped. So it never had a huge amount of um, first time customers coming through and eventually it went uh, bankrupt. But now it's been bought by a new company with a really fresh vision and They've seen what they're doing in like uh, tunnels like Flyspot in Poland, where they they're able to uh, get the the prices really really cheap, and they've just dedicated themselves to making it one of the the go to places for uh, for skydivers and pro flyers. Because you, other than going over to like one of the Russian tunnels, they, you can't get cheaper cheaper time than uh, than in Finland at the moment. Sure. Well, um, and the original ownership was was Russian, was it not? It was. Yeah, it was a Russian oligarch. Yeah, I can't remember his name, but because uh, yeah. I mean the facility <laughs> itself is beautiful. It's got the tunnel, it's got the big wave pool, it's got uh, uh, the restaurant. I mean, it's an enormous facility. Um, yeah. But the first time I went out there, I was actually going to visit uh, Nomers um, and Rob were both in the tunnel, and nice. uh, I was driving on that road, and it's a fucking massive four lane back country road with nobody on it because the borders closed. <laughs> So yeah, it's uh, it's a road to nowhere. Literally. Yeah, it's it's a it's a one and a half hour private road to a wind tunnel, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a really bizarre place, but uh, I I absolutely loved loved working there. It was such a an incredible time because I went from having maybe five or six hours of tunnel time and plenty of jumps um, to becoming an int- instructor there, and then the chief instructor and. It, it taught me so much, not just about flying, but about kind of managing and uh, kind of dealing with people and coaching. It was a really bizarre place to uh, to spend two years of my life because we basically just hid in the cabin in the woods for two years, went to the tunnel on our uh, off days when there was like no one there and just flew a ton of time um, in this incredible facility. Like it's, it's five star. And especially now they're opening up the the bunk rooms and things to to give people accommodation options nearby you can fly you can eat in the restaurants um go to the surf machines like you mentioned like there's so many uh awesome things to keep people occupied out there um that they're they're doing a really good job and it makes me very happy to uh to go and run uh run tunnel camps out there now Oh, yeah. I mean, I was so surprised when I, I started to find out how many people I knew were coming through here. I had, uh, mm-hmm. um, I want to say, what, six months ago, eight months ago, had Jimmy McCarthy on because he was out here running nice. a, a tunnel camp. And so it's all, all the usual suspects that were everywhere else all of a sudden are showing up in my backyard. It's fucking fantastic. It's awesome, right? Yeah, it, like, I love it. It's I'll go along for a tunnel camp and then they'll be like, three of my best mates who are also coaches who are all out there at the same time and we'll go and shred after we're done uh, done coaching in the evening and be able to do a bunch of uh, fun flying for ourselves it's uh yeah it's a really uh, unique place for sure so looking down the road what's your say five year and ten year plan because you're still a, a very young guy so you've got a lot of time ahead of you yeah that's a that's a very good question um <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing for dinner, man, uh, <laughs> let alone in five years' time. Um, in general, I, I I love what I'm doing right now, and I want to keep doing it for as long as possible. But if there's one thing I've learned, it's that I, I get bored if I do one thing too much. So I like to spread myself around. I, I, every day should be school day for me, so I still uh, I go and participate at events, make sure I'm... Uh, learning new things, new ways of coaching people, um, trying new sports, uh, recently taking up uh, soaring, uh, like paragliding on the coast on the dunes in the Netherlands, which is 
incredible. Yeah. Um, so you can like go along to the beach for a day and literally not touch the ground for like six, seven, eight hours if you want to. It's oh, uh, fantastic. It's literally just endless swoops and toe drags. So um, that's been really fun to pick up. Uh, but yeah, in terms of like a five, 10 year plan, I'd, I'd like to still be doing this um, as much as I can. But hopefully I've tried some uh, some other things, maybe traveled a little bit more. Uh, I'm always trying to get to new countries each year. This year I, I got to China and Asia for the first time, which was really cool. Um, so, yeah, hopefully still still load organizing, still coaching, um, but probably have my uh, my finger in a few different pies as well. Well, and both sports seem to be branching off in directions that I would not necessarily have predicted along the way, soaring or speed flying being one of the big ones that I've seen more and more jumpers peeling off and and, uh, going almost going back to using their canopy as a way to get safely to the ground and then saving the sporty stuff for the ground launching that they're doing, which exactly is is a huge switch. It really is. is. And it's yeah, terribly it's... appealing. I, I actually was just talking, I think, to Lori about, I think, the only way that uh, I see an air sports getting into the Olympics in any time soon is going to be a swooping version that's now going to be done with ground launching instead of skydiving. Honestly, I think you might be right. Yeah, I don't think there's the uh, the, the mass market appeal or um, uh, the, the, the kind of... Being able to actually bring it to an audience in a in a meaningful way uh, in tunnel flying or in uh, skydiving at the moment, but yeah, I think you might be right. Like the the sort of sports where they can kind of uh, ground launch and do runs down a hill, like a I don't know downhill mountain biking, and have people kind of uh, along the route. That uh, yeah. that would be a spectator sport for people for sure, and I think it'd be. Uh, interesting to see where it goes for sure yeah i just had uh jason moletsky was out visiting me for a few days here and we got on that conversation and we both agreed that skydiving as a sport in the olympics doesn't seem feasible if for no other reason put the fatality stuff to the side <laughs> you can't watch a guy climb into an airplane and then fly off in the distance and then 20 minutes later that's that guy doing something you don't quite understand but if you can watch that same guy on the same hill that the olympic ski jumpers are off of ground launching from there running courses and swooping at the bottom that's accessible and it's understandable in a very easy way for the general public to grip onto exactly yeah it puts it right in front of people there's no waiting for a, a ride to altitude there's no uh yeah, watching tiny little dots moving around in the sky and maybe being able to live stream some some footage again, just sure. watching GoPro footage. Sure. So uh yeah, no, I think uh I think you're right. I'm I'm intrigued to see someone pick that up and uh develop it into an idea where it, we can actually kind of uh reasonably think about getting it into the Olympics as a sport. For sure. Well, it's probably the closest at the moment, but again, you can't really just build a, a multi-million dollar facility for just tunnel flying like uh if they're going to spend that much money it has to be for a huge part of the games and sure. uh, tunnel just isn't that at the moment oh I, I i agree with you but i also push back just a little bit in that the tunnels are becoming so prevalent everywhere that now it would not be difficult to have countries with multiple choices i mean for fuck's sake there's two tunnels in finland you that's know, a very good point yeah so you Use almost the facilities that are already there yeah you almost have the infrastructure and granted uh the crowd sizes are not going to be that big but i mean they were surfing in tahiti for the olympics this year and this is true yeah for you know, french french olympics and yeah uh, you know yeah. so i mean it's i think that there's a chance now because there's so many more sports coming into the Olympics that are non-standard. I mean, come on, break dancing. <laughs> I'm, I think we've all seen the, uh, the videos of that now. But, uh, do, do you know they've actually, uh, um, they've already taken it off the schedule for 2028? Have they really? Yeah. That's such a shame. Like the the other break dancers in the, uh, the competition – no one's talking about them and i watched some of the routines they were incredible like they they're athletes and yeah. they've been upstaged by a meme 
basically. It's a, it's a really much. sad day. Pretty for, much. Uh, for that sport. Oh, yeah. If but, you Google uh, breakdancing Olympics, there's only one video coming up. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The All that being said, right? it was pretty fucking funny. <laughs> it was. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a reason everyone's watching it. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, again, you, you, five to ten years, you're just kind of winging it and having fun with it. But, I mean, potentially, there's a lot of longevity in these sports. I think so. Yeah, like, this is... Uh, all my friends who I knew in gymnastics and diving, they, they've been out of those sports for the better part of a decade now whereas like in tunnel flying and skydiving we're still kind of in our prime and i know i coach guys who are still competing uh well at a high level in their their 60s and their 70s um so i'm i'm very excited to to be part of a sport where there is the possibility to keep doing this for for such a long time because the the peak physical prowess is uh is not as important to competing at a high level in this sport as it is in others so sure. i think we're very lucky to have that as a, a such an open opportunity for everyone sure and i mean uh, especially if it's if it's the type of flying that you're talking about it again boils much more down to finesse than it does you know muscle you, you don't you can't muscle the air you have to finesse it and so exactly you know, unless you're like me and you were a meat hauler chucking drogues for, you know, 8,000, <laughs> 9,000 tandems and beating the shit out of yourself, potentially you're going to get through it with a lot less physical stuff than guys like me. Speaking of, especially at your age with the level of flying that you've been doing, how do you find physically uh, it affects you? It, does it negatively affect you? What do you do to counteract any negative stuff? Um. So I'm... I just takes over to 30 last year um and my body hurts all the time now but uh, everyone told me when i get into my 30s it's just pain and they weren't lying um but yeah it's the i find the nature of the sport means that i a lot of what i do especially like in the uh, the tunnel is about um kind of oozing calm translating that calm to uh, to my students so if they see a calm coach there'll be a calm flyer and with calmness comes uh, uh, a lot of benefits so i definitely came up uh through the uh, the tunnel instructor route wrestling with first timers and just absolutely beating the shit out of my body and these days when i'm mostly uh, focusing on the the coaching if if I'm having to wrestle with someone in order to get them to fly something, then that's probably indicative to me that there's some bit of understanding that they don't have yet. And there's going to be a better way to, to teach them that particular move than just holding them in the wind and hoping for it to, uh, to work out. So I found as I've progressed and developed as a coach, I've also been able to take a lot of the, the wear and tear off of my body. Like, there are still mistakes and you part of the job as a coach in the tunnel is to uh, save people when they uh, make mistakes and prevent crashes. And that often means me using my body as a, a meat crash pad for, uh, for people driving at the glass. So I try to avoid those and you try to, you know, read the student, see if they're at the right stage to be uh, learning a back layout or, or whatever, whatever the move might be um so all of it is kind of focused on helping them progress as fast as safely possible um both for their benefits and for my own as well because if i'm broken i can't coach anyone sure work work smarter not harder exactly yeah I, uh, and i find I, it's the same as skydiving too to be honest for sure uh, yeah especially with uh um like the the number of jumpers that we have these days who are looking to learn to angle fly um like coaching angles beginner angles is probably the scariest thing i do with my day i, <laughs> I feel like uh i'm just putting a big old target on the back of my head and then telling people to uh to chase it um so that's definitely the thing that i'm the most cautious about is uh teaching people the the safe way to do it and also helping them understand the the risk factors in, involved because one big crash can uh, can put you out. So making sure people know the risks of what they're doing when we're working with these 
quite insane speeds and uh it's in closing speeds as well it's uh it's really important for people to understand the the risks of what they're doing uh so that they're more likely to uh um you know maybe not go 100 percent power bring it back to like 70 or 80 and then have a bit more control there um in their range sure well and nowadays too the, the angle flying it's not what used to just be a tracking dive. Tracking dive was you jumped out, picked the direction and pegged it and chased everybody around. But now yeah. angle flying is so dynamic going from uh, head down to head up to this way to that way, all over the place, as well as throwing in a few fucking style moves in the middle of it all. So <laughs> it's got to be head on a swivel kind of territory. It really does. Yeah, you have to keep the blinkers open the whole time because uh, you're not just focusing on uh, chasing the leader, um, but you're also trying to understand where the other flyers are in your group, what they're doing, um, knowing what the next move coming up is, because maybe you're going to have to cut a corner to catch up with the group again. And understanding that cutting that corner means that you and other members of the group are going to be tracking in basically completely different directions for a while so having that kind of uh big picture view of the whole group and the whole dive is uh, a really important part of it especially as we progress into these faster jumps uh with more kind of intricate transitions um you really have to know the people that you're jumping with and earn their trust by showing them that you can be a, a safe skydiver or you can stay in your spot no matter what um and if you're not then it's normally time to say hey maybe i shouldn't be in this group i should go into a, a lower group and i have huge amounts of respect for people who are willing to put their hand up and say it's like yeah this is i i, I can't be the the safe skydiver i want to be on these sorts of jumps so uh, that I used to do this Honestly, that used to be my default setting was walking into a, a group jump if I'd been invited on one and go, I am the one that's most likely to fuck this up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, if for no other reason than if I got it right, I felt happy. But if I got it wrong, I told everybody. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like we're all human. We're all going to make mistakes. But uh, being able to be open to that is such an important skill, especially as a skydiver. Like, uh as I've come up through the, the sport as an organizer and kind of met other coaches and organizers and kind of been able to take them off the pedestal that I kind of uh, held them on in my head, um, seeing them make mistakes, own up to mistakes, um, be able to kind of uh, deal with them in a constructive way. It's been really helpful for me. So now I like, start of the day, I'll be telling my groups, like, Hey guys, we're, we're going to do our best here, but, you're going to make mistakes. I'm probably going to make mistakes. We're all here to learn and we're going to do that together. And I, I will hold myself accountable to you if you hold yourself accountable to me as well. So sure. then it's not a, a blame game. It's uh, everyone trying to uh, to get better together. And uh, it kind of helps take the onus off of people. So they, they're less worried about uh, kind of owning up to mistakes and feeling like they need to, to put on a certain show. For oh, people. sure. Well, and that's turned out to be one of the, the best parts about doing this podcast for all these years is especially having the high-end, well-known skydivers coming on the show, telling about the times they fucked it up, telling about the times that they were scared or they did something wrong, and not talking about it with any level of shame, but talking about it as a learning experience. Um, and people really love that. I love knowing that the guy that I look up to was nervous at some point in his career or is still nervous to this day about specific jumps or this or that it humanizes them in a way that uh, makes it uh, again accessible i now i know i can learn to do what he's doing because he's been where i am exactly yeah it's uh it it reminds everyone that we're all human and uh like, as much as we want to go and learn from people and uh like, have a good time with them if we see them not as some infallible person but like an actual human being who is making mistakes exactly the same as us then it it allows us to take the shame away from from making mistakes obviously there is a little bit of shame involved because we have to beat ourselves up the right amount to learn from mistakes so that sure. we don't repeat them again but uh being able to you know 
own up to things is a, a really important skill in life uh, sure. and especially in skydiving where uh if someone isn't owning up um like sometimes you get problem uh problem people who no matter what's happening on a jump they will always be blaming everyone else and pointing the fingers wherever else they uh they might might decide and as much as i can i try to ch- chat to those people and just say it's like hey like it's okay. You don't have to understand this now, but go home and think about it later. Um, but maybe looking, even if you don't think it was your fault now, go and sit with it for a while. Ask yourself what you could have done differently to uh, to avoid this situation from happening. And uh, maybe you'll come and learn some lessons from it. But and the, mindset and is everything. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's both being able to learn and progress with your own skills in the sport, but it's also keeping everybody safe, which at the end of the day, as long as everybody's safe, we all live to tomorrow to try it again. Exactly. Yeah. Live to jump another day. Yeah, man. So with all that said, uh, tell me what events you've got coming up. Uh, um, the season is still going strong where you're at. Uh, and then please tell everybody if they want to come jump with you, get some coaching from you. How do they find you? Awesome. Um, so it's been a really busy summer so far. Uh, next week, I'm off to Germany um, for summer spring boogie in Hildesheim. Then I think a couple of weeks after that, we've got the uh, head up record attempts uh, for the Netherlands. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. I'll be, uh, um, I think the first time we'll be attempting a head up record in like eight years. Um, so that's going to be fun. Then we have Shark Boogie in the Netherlands as well. And after that, it's kind of getting into uh, the winter season. So I've already got camps planned in uh, in Aeronautica for um, October, November and December. And they're already filling up really fast. So I'm uh, I'm getting, getting stoked to, uh, to be back out there again. And uh, maybe we'll get to do some flying together as well. You never know. Well, um, nothing else, we'll make sure and grab a beer. Oh, for sure, man. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so what's but your yeah. socials? How do people find you on social media? Um, I'm most prevalent on uh, on Instagram. So uh, Connor Fig, uh, at Connor Fig on Instagram. Um, and if anyone's ever interested in joining me there, uh, that's probably the best place to, to get a hold of me. I'm on Facebook as well. Um, or my uh, website is uh, serendipityfreefly.com. Uh, www. <laughs> awesome. Connor, I'll tell you what, man, I, I know you, you've you been super busy. You carved out a little bit of time to sit down and talk with me, and I'm so glad that we were able to make it happen. So thank you so much for sitting down. It was my absolute pleasure, man. Thanks for inviting me on. And uh, yeah, I hope we can do it again one day. And we'll see you in October. <laughs> thank you, buddy. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast brought to you as always by, well, wait, not as always, actually. Brought to you now by Gyro. Formerly known as NZ Aerosports, you'll head to gyro.com for their next level line of canopies. By Pussfoot, the Extreme Sports Collective. Head over to pussfoot.com to check it out. By Summit Parachute Systems, Check out SummitParachuteSystems.com to talk to Jarrett Martin and the gang about kick-ass pilot rigs, rigging courses, and more. By Flyaway Indoor Skydiving. Go to FlyawayTN.com and check out all the cutting-edge stuff to come. By Pure Spectrum CBD. Head to PureSpectrumCBD.com to check out their wide range of CBD products. And as for us, head to the LunaticFringePodcast.com to listen to any of the hundreds of episodes currently available. Hit the link for our YouTube channel, pick up your copy of the Lunatic Fringe book or The Accidental Stripper, and get a sneak peek at upcoming guests. Once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Oh,